Hey everyone, welcome to section 3.4, Game Theory in Bitcoin, where we're going to be doing a game theoretical analysis of the Bitcoin protocol and introduce some of the basic game theory concepts that we use to analyze things like blockchain protocols. So great, we have this system where everyone's history is this chain of blocks with dependencies on one another, and miners are doing all of this computational work, computing hashes, competing to propose the next valid block. So this system is censorship resistant, it's reversion resistant, uh, but only if we assume that there's an honest majority of CPU power. You know, what's preventing Mallory from just spending a bunch of money and buying a bunch of bulky hardware that can compute hashes really, really fast? And suddenly Mallory is computing hashes way faster than everyone else. And now she has over 50% of the mining hash rate. If Mallory now has a majority of the hash power, she can decide to censor certain users, and she can also revert history at will. So we want to do everything in our power to make it as difficult as possible for Mallory to do this. And we hope to do this with game theory. There's a great quote from Charlie Munger where he says, Show me the incentive, and I'll show you the outcome. So the better we're able to model all the incentives of the people in our protocol, the easier it is for us to make guarantees about things like censorship and reversion resistance. So in order to analyze the incentives of Bitcoin, we have to model the protocol as a game. First, who are the players in this game? What actions are available to them? What's the timing of their interactions? And what are the payoffs as a result of the interaction? Do certain actions make them more money than others? Are there some actions that are just prohibitively expensive to do? So first, who are the players? We're really just trying to figure out the incentives of our miners. So the players that we care about are Alice, Mallory, and Bob. Jing, who's not participating in mining, will be left out of this analysis. Well, remember, they each have their own transaction pool. So one choice they get to make is which transactions to include in their block. Maybe they include all of the transactions that pay the most transaction fees. Or maybe for some reason, Bob might remove all transactions except for transactions paying him. Or Bob could choose to just mine an empty block. So once Bob has decided which transactions to include in his next block, He'll put those transactions into a Merkle tree, and so the transactions Merkle root will be included in the block header, and the nonce for the block will start at zero, but which previous block header hash should he choose? Basically, which block does this block have a dependency on? Does he choose to mine on top of the longest chain, mining on top of this block? Or does he choose to mine on top of Mallory's one block fork? Or maybe for some reason he wants to mine on this block, or the Genesis block. And what if Mallory mines a new block, and now both of these forks have the same length? Does he choose to mine on Mallory's chain, or Alice's chain? So Bob gets to choose which block he mines on top of. So once Bob has decided which block to mine on top of, he'll start computing proof of work, iterating the nonce, and computing the block header hash over and over again, until he finds a nonce that gives him a block header hash with enough leading zero bits. So now Bob has a new valid block. If Bob follows the Bitcoin protocol honestly, he should just propagate his block to the network. And then Bob and Alice will continue mining on this longest chain. But Bob could also withhold this block, not show it to his peers, and just start mining on it in private. So once he's found a valid block, Bob can choose when to publish it to the network. And the next question we're going to ask is, what is the timing of these interactions? Now, this is pretty obvious, but all of our miners are mining blocks at the same time. Also, when Bob finds a second block, he can start mining on that second block immediately, but Mallory and Alice don't know about the block until that packet reaches them on the network. So latency definitely affects which blocks miners know about. Also, consider what happens if Alice and Bob connect as peers. Suddenly, Bob can send a packet directly to Alice. So Alice will know about Bob's block sooner, and Bob can feel a bit more confident that all the other miners have seen his block. So being connected to more peers helps miners send and receive information faster. So the last question we're going to take a look at is, what are the payoffs as a result of these interactions? So nowadays, it's pointless to mine Bitcoin unless you have specialized hardware that's designed just for computing lots and lots of SHA-256 hashes. So Alice is going to spend a bunch of money on hardware, Mallory is going to spend a bunch of money on hardware, and Bob is going to spend a bunch of money on hardware. So one of the big costs to our players is the fixed cost of having to buy this mining hardware. So once our miners start computing hashes, they're going to be using lots and lots of electricity. So another cost is the variable cost of electricity to do this mining. And so the rewards to our players from spending all this money on hardware and electricity is first and foremost the block reward, which is that blank check transaction that mints money for whoever mines that block. 
And miners also get the transaction fees from all the transactions that they included in their block. And lastly, our miners could make money from successful double spends. And so ultimately, our payoff is equal to our rewards minus the costs. So now that we've successfully modeled Bitcoin as a game, there's some different properties that we tend to look for when we start analyzing the game. So now, to introduce you to the first property, we're going to be covering one of the most famous games in game theory, The Prisoner's Dilemma. So our criminals Mallory and Bob have just been caught and they've been sent to two different police stations. And the cops tell them, we caught you shoplifting vegetables from a store. And we can put you away on a misdemeanor charge for that crime. But they also highly suspect that Mallory and Bob robbed a bank earlier that week. But they don't have enough evidence to put them away on that felony charge. So the cop tells Mallory, you have two options. Mallory can either stay quiet, or she can confess and give the cops enough evidence to prove that they actually did rob the bank. So if Mallory stays quiet and Bob also stays quiet, they both go away for one year on the misdemeanor charge for shoplifting the vegetables. But if Mallory stays quiet and Bob actually confesses, he'll give the cops enough evidence to prove that they did rob the bank. So Mallory will go away for three years while Bob gets off scot-free because he confessed. Of course, the same deal stands for Mallory. If she confesses and Bob stays quiet, she'll get released immediately while Bob will go away for three years under the felony charges for bank robbery. Now, if both Mallory and Bob confess to the bank robbery, they won't get the full three years, but they'll each get put away for two years on felony charges. So we can model the payoffs from each scenario in this matrix. If Bob chooses to stay quiet, Mallory can choose to either stay quiet or to confess. Now, if Mallory stays quiet, she'll spend a year in jail. If she confesses, she won't have to spend any time in jail. So of course, the best strategy for her in this case is to confess. If Bob confesses, Mallory again can choose between staying quiet and confessing. Now, if she stays quiet, she'll spend three years in jail. But if she confesses, she'll only spend two years in jail. So of course, she's going to confess. So no matter whether Bob decides to stay quiet or to confess, Mallory's best strategy is to confess. When a player has the same best strategy, no matter what actions the other players take, this is called a dominant strategy. So in a Bitcoin context, a dominant strategy is a strategy that will give the largest payoff regardless of how other miners are behaving. And of course, we want honest behavior following the protocol rules to be the dominant strategy for miners. As a miner, it'd be nice to know that I'd be making the most money if I follow the protocol honestly, regardless of what everyone else is doing. Now to introduce the second concept, we're going to be going over a game called the stag hunt. So Bob and Mallory are no longer in jail and have picked up hunting as a hobby. And in this hunting ground, they can either hunt hares or stags. Now if Mallory and Bob hunt together, they'll be able to take the stag down. But if Mallory tries to hunt the stag alone, she will always fail. And same with Bob. So if Bob chooses to hunt the stag, Mallory can either choose to hunt the stag together with Bob or hunt the hares alone. If Mallory chooses to hunt the stag with Bob, she'll get more meat versus if she just hunts the hares alone. So Mallory's best strategy is to hunt the stag. If Bob chooses to hunt hares, then Mallory can choose to also hunt hares or to try to hunt the stag alone. Of course, if Mallory chooses to hunt the stag alone, she's not gonna get any meat because she can't do it alone. But if she hunts hares, both her and Bob will each get one unit of meat. So Mallory's best strategy in this case is to go hunt the hares. So let's say Bob and Mallory both decide to hunt hares. If Mallory decides to switch strategies and go off and try to hunt the stag alone, she'll get no meat. So she has no incentive to switch. And similarly, if Bob tries to go and hunt the stag alone, He'll also get no meat, so he has no incentive to switch. We have hit what's called a Nash equilibrium. As long as the other player doesn't switch their strategy, you have no incentive to switch yours. We can also look at the case where Bob and Mallory have both agreed to hunt the stag together. Now, if Mallory switches strategies and decides to go hunt the hare, she'll go from having three units of meat to two units of meat. So she's not going to do that. And if Bob decides to go off and hunt the hares instead of the stag, he'll also decrease the amount of meat he gets by one unit. So now we have another Nash Equilibrium, where neither player can improve their payoff by switching to a different strategy, as long as the other player continues to hunt the stag with them. So this is a weaker guarantee than a dominant strategy, but if we can't get honest behavior to be a dominant strategy, we at least want to guarantee that honest mining forms a Nash Equilibrium. So as long as everyone else is mining honestly, I have no incentive to switch from honest mining to malicious mining. And the last thing I want to introduce you guys to is this field called mechanism design. 
Now, mechanism design, which is sometimes called reverse game theory, is working back from a desired outcome to creating the game so that the players have the incentives to reach that outcome. For example, our desired outcome could be to create this history that is censorship resistant and reversion resistant. And then we can construct our protocol so block proposers or miners trying to maximize money creates this censorship and reversion resistant ledger. What's great about game theory and mechanism design is there's so much literature around these fields that can really help us when we're trying to analyze and design blockchain protocols. And we can take these concepts to start analyzing protocols like Bitcoin. For example, one property that we might want our blockchain protocol to have is that honest mining is a dominant strategy as long as you don't have a majority of power. So of course, if you have 51% of the hash power, you can potentially make more money by reverting history and double spending or force people to pay higher transaction fees by censoring people who don't pay you above a certain amount. But it turns out that this might not be true. There could be a different dishonest mining strategy that gives you a better payoff even if you have less than 51% of the hash power. And we'll cover one such strategy in the next lecture, section 3.5 on selfish mining. I hope to see you there.